Well, good evening and welcome back to Copernic's FNL Friday Night Livestream. Uh, my name is Drew Desker. I'm the director here at Copernic. It's gr uh, great to, uh, to have you with us uh, this evening. Looking forward to... Uh, 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 let me make sure that I can actually be heard. Yes, I can. I think I can. Here we go. Um, anyway, um, the, it's great, to, again, to, to be back, uh, back on the air, as it were. Uh, looking forward to tonight's uh, program. And uh, we're also very happy to announce that uh, come July 2nd, we will actually be uh, able to open up Copernic for our Friday night programs right here uh, on, in person at, uh, at the observatory. And we are also going to do our best to attempt to uh, live stream at the same time. So for those people that aren't quite ready to uh, make that transition uh, to a, an in-person uh, event, uh, we'll still try to keep you connected. Our first uh, program uh, on July 2nd will be Roy Williams, one of our educators, uh, doing a program called um, uh, Summer Skies and tell you a little bit about uh, what, to, what to see in the summer skies. And, um, and of course, those people that are here afterwards, if the skies are clear, we'll take you out to our, our domes. We'll also have some uh, scopes out in the yard and um, uh, start to actually enjoy the, uh, the summer skies. Uh, also, letting you know that... Uh, our summer camps are going to be in person. We, um, uh, in fact, the, the, some of the some of the camps were so popular that they, they filled up uh, early, and um, uh, we actually opened up uh, additional sections of those, of those uh, for three of those camps. So, uh, if you have a, a child or a grandchild that uh, you think might be interested in one of our camps, these are for camps for students between uh, entering second grade through twelfth grade. They are week long camps. They uh, they go nine to ninety three during the day. And uh, covering a wide range of topics from uh, just general discovery through uh, programming with Arduinos and Raspberry Pi to uh, high altitude balloons, uh, where the, the students will build a, uh, a payload that will go on a weather balloon and fly up to over 100,000 feet. And then we'll, uh, we'll track it with a radio, radio beacon and then uh, bring it down. Um, okay, somebody's saying, is the audio on? And I believe it is. So, uh, uh, nice to see the the Carter family there and uh, but anyway uh, let's transition to our program um, we are very fortunate again to have uh, Phil Cooper uh, who just is a, a a Wikipedia of knowledge of uh, Thank uh, you. Uh, uh, of uh, all things space and uh, uh, I, I really enjoy I mean I've, I've been a space nerd for forever but uh, Phil always manages to uh, uh, fill my bucket with uh, with new information. So uh, really looking forward to, um, uh, to Phil's uh, talk about uh, about the space lab, uh, sky lab. Pardon me. Anyway, um, we will uh, let's go in and uh, let's do this. Let's get into uh, let's get, let's let's get into space. So uh, Phil, we'll uh, okay. I, I think if you want to go ahead and share your screen and get things started. And again, for those that are watching on on screen. Uh, on YouTube. Uh, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Phil, uh, put them right in the chat and uh, we will ask, we'll, uh, we'll sort of hold those questions toward the end and uh, uh, you know, then I'll, I'll present them to Phil and he'll, he'll answer your questions. So, um, okay, so I'm going to... Uh, we should be good to go. Do you see Copernic June 2021 on the screen? I do. Yes, right. I do. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining in what's turned into a series of, of talks on our American space program and our human spaceflight efforts. And tonight we're going to talk about Skylab. Skylab is, uh, I feel, a, an amazing program that uh, has been lost a little bit to time. It was in between Apollo and in between the space shuttle. We seem to only hear about Skylab when some piece of space junk is going to fall. Like just recently, uh, a bit of uh, Chinese uh, rocketry fell, and the news reports were all kind of comparing it to, to Skylab. So Skylab was much more than its end. So Interesting. A little technical glitch on my end, but we'll get past that. So Skylab, living on the edge. Today we're going to talk about 
the different uh, physical parts of Skylab, the uh, actual spaceship itself. And we're going to get into a lot of uh, the experiments that are done on it and a lot of the reasons for um, Skylab being there because it had a very big importance to the American space program. I'm going to wait for Skylab to come across the screen here. Uh, I'm going to talk about Skylab in, in the sense of it's one mission when in fact three different crews went on Skylab. So we'll actually get to about the individuals, uh, the different astronauts at the very end, but I don't want to confuse it with, two uh, with three different crews. So anyway, let's start at the very beginning. And we can't get any more at the beginning than the American space program with uh, the pre-Sputnik era, which Werner von Braun and a guy named George Muller were very much in charge of where America was going then. And pre Sputnik is before 1957. And their plan was for large space stations. They were looking at 287 feet diameter. Uh, they wanted to have large rockets bring up big pieces of a space station, assemble it up there, and then the space station would then make rockets that went elsewhere. So in this case, this is a moon rocket. And off to the moon they go. They might make a space base there. They might do all kinds of exploration. But the idea behind it is to have these large stations in space being able to make other spacecraft. And then once enough is built, they would actually build one that could go to Mars. These are all borrowed from the movie 2001 Space Odyssey. That was the plan. Uh, there's no money for it. There was no political will for it, but that's what they wanted to do. Now, that's the space infrastructure, and that's, that's the idea that they had to be able to. It's almost like making a highway. So where do you want to go? You want to go to Mars? You want to go back to the moon? You want to go to Jupiter? Off you can go. After the Sputnik era, we have a different president, and we have different goals. John Kennedy steps in and says, wait a minute, this infrastructure thing is fine, but I have a different goal for this nation, and it's moonbound. So he steps in and says, that, you know, we're going to the moon in this decade, um, before this decade is out. As we all know, we did that, but it sucked all the dollars, all the money, and all the resources uh, of our space program to make this happen. So the space stations and the other things had to wait on the burn. There was some money for some satellites around Earth. We visited a few of the planets with some space program, with, with, with space programs. But unless it had the word moon written on it, it didn't get a lot of money. And as you know, we were all set to go on the moon, and Apollo was in full swing. In 1964, Lyndon Johnson got NASA together and said, okay, where do you want to go after Apollo? And what can you do with all the technology that Apollo is making? Can we do something with it other than go to the moon? So they got together, uh, Werner von Braun, all the teams of Houston, and this George uh, Miller, and they ended up arguing a lot. They thought that they might use the command module that was for the lunar landings and make it a solar observatory that they would make something called the Apollo Telescope Mount that would be uh, sent up into space and it would observe the stars. There was a lot of pressure to do a space telescope uh, from the scientific community. And then it is a 287 feet in diameter, but it is the idea of a space station using the third stage of a Saturn V or the second stage of a rocket called the Saturn 1B that we're going to learn about in a little bit. This is what they came up with uh, from where President, or the, what President Johnson asked them to come up with. The bickering or the discussions were ended on uh, August of 1966 when uh, George Muller went up to the blackboard and he made this diagram, which is the third stage of the Saturn or the second stage of the 1B and the Apollo telescope mount, all connected as one, and he signed it 
And he said, that's what you're going to do. And he walked out. So really the birth of Skylab, combining two projects, the Apollo telescope mount here and this stage from a uh, spent stage from a rocket came into being Skylab. Some of the other technology that we had, which is, is just so sad that we, we've lost, is Saturn was actually a family of rockets. And this goes back to the, the late 50s. These were on the drawing board well before we were going to the moon. The Saturn I uh, was meant to be a cargo ship and parts for building these space stations. The Saturn 1B uh, is uh, a very powerful rocket for uh, taking astronauts and anything, uh, equipment you'd want. And then the Saturn V, which ultimately was the moon rocket, but there was also uh, another one that was planned that was even, I would say, maybe 50% larger than the Saturn V, the N1, that uh, just never got built. So they had lunar modules, command modules, they had all these rockets, um, and they had to go get some money. But Lyndon Johnson, was fine with that. He did uh, give them, or with Congress, appropriate some money for Skylab. So why Skylab? The number one reason on both uh, George Muller and Werner von Braun's mind was Mars. They knew that the moon was it was going to happen. I mean, even though it's in the mid '60s, they knew the technology was on a drawing board. They knew it was going to happen. But here's the catch. The time travel, the travel time there is a year. So there and back is two years. They thought they might stay six months since it took so long to get there. And the longest flight to date was 14 days. And that wasn't even on Apollo. That was one of the uh, Gemini missions. So that was the sum knowledge of our uh, working and living in space was, was 14 days. But the distance to Mars is just huge for anyone that uh, attended the previous talk that uh, Zoe did from SPIF, uh, and she had us do distances in the solar system. It's just incredibly uh, amazing how far the next planet like that, Mars, is. How big is Skylab? Just want to give you, we're going to talk a lot about it, but I just, I always like to show you perspective of what we're talking about size-wise. This is the International Space Station. This is the space shuttle. And this is Skylab. Skylab is, is pretty huge. Uh, in my opinion, for going back to 1973, it's larger than the space shuttle. And this is the habitable, habitable area of the uh, ISS. And, you know, this would fit on the inside of here. So it was, it was a big deal. And to give you a, a more you know, human perspective, they built two of them because as the movie Contact said, uh, why, build, why build one when you can build two for twice the price? And that's what they did. They built two of them. They hoped they were going to put two in orbit. They didn't, but actually they put one right in the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. And this is a picture of how large it is. And that's just the living area right there. So the rest of it, Skylab and other areas are above it. And we'll see that in a little bit. So it's big, it's massive. And, you know, at the time it, it was a big deal. So what are the goals and experiments that they're looking for to do in Skylab? They want to do life science. They want to learn about how humans react to space. The Apollo telescope mount was going to allow solar observing and astronomy to be done. They were going to turn the cameras back at Earth and work on mineral resources, geology, weather, uh, and material science. Could we weld, braze, melting? Can crystals grow? We don't know any of these things. We, we know what we can do in 14 days, which at the time is just a lot of survival and just staying in orbit. And student research, it's really fantastic. They opened it up to 19 different student proposals. The astronauts got to pick them because they were the ones that had to do it and it had to be above their work schedules. And then the other is human adaptability. You know, how about, can we work in space or dexterity? They, you know, there were some scientists who said that they Humans will pass away after a month in space. You just can't live that long. So it had lofty goals. And when you read these, these sound like, you know, clearly this is all that we're doing in our current space station as well. So they were, you know, they really kicked the ball off and started it, uh, started it rolling. 
So here's a picture of Skylab as it would have looked, and we'll learn a little bit why it didn't look like that when it, uh, it got into orbit. So we're gonna go over the different parts after we go over its length and diameter. The length is 83 feet, uh, which is, you know, for space standards and what goes up in space is, is really, again, large size, 22 feet diameter. Its orbit above the Earth is 274 miles. That's approximately the same as the International Space Station. Its period, it goes around 94 minutes in an orbit, again, same as the uh, space station. The pressurized volume, which is the living area, is 12,417 feet. It's the equivalent of a three-story home or 32 concrete trucks. And it's a third of the size of the space station. Now, this happened in one launch, and the space station was built over uh, – more than a decade and a half. Crews visited, there were three astronauts at the time, we had a total of nine. Again, we're gonna talk about them as we go along a little generically, and then at, at, toward the end, we'll talk about a little bit out of each one of them individually and how they had a, a special role in, in Skylab. Skylab cost $10 billion. Uh, to put it in perspective, Apollo cost 194. So it was, you know, it's what space cost at the time. It wasn't any more. It really wasn't, really wasn't any less. Parts of Skylab is the Apollo telescope. That's what was hanging below that chalk drawing that uh, appeared on the uh, blackboard. It's a, it's an eight experiment telescope, and it was a, really a program on its own. It has X-ray telescope, visual telescope. It does visible light. It it has at least a dozen purposes, and it was revolutionary at the time. It, it, it had one huge drawback, though, and it really is a sign of the times, and that is it used film. When you think of that, you're like, film? Why, why couldn't they have done like, you know, like our space probes and all do now? Uh, we just didn't have the technology. As a matter of fact, I was, I was fascinated on a Friday night talk that we had last month on our types of cameras on our different space probes. And the Curiosity rover on Mars is the first that had a camera that is equivalent to the human eye. And the Perseverance rover that's up there now is the first space probe that has cameras that are uh, better than human vision. So that technology uh, to get away from film didn't exist uh, back in 73. And, you know, when you think about it, isn't that we haven't had it that long ourselves. So Apollo telescope. Next is the command module. This is a regular Apollo command module. Module It would have flown on Apollo 18. Uh, the astronauts viewed it as a private phone booth. They went up there, shut the door, and they could call their families. It also was the coolest and quietest place on the space station. The key here is it's not a resupply ship, which means that it only brought the crew up. It didn't bring up any supplies. So Skylab had to bring everything with it, every bit of food, every bit of clothing. You know, they maybe have brought a few personal items with them on this command module. But this was strictly just to get the astronauts up there and to be able to, uh, to get them home. Next, we have the multiple docking adapter. This is here in the middle. Uh, this allowed two command modules to uh, dock there at the same time. And then the red circle is the control panel to the Apollo telescope mount. I just wanna show you this and have you look at it. If you look at it, this is the only room in Skylab where they designed it with zero G in mind because there's equipment or something on what would be the floor, the ceiling, the sides, it's just in a complete circle. As we'll see, the rest of Skylab is not designed that way, it's, and it's for a purpose. The airlock module. This is how the astronauts get out in space because right above the airlock module is the Apollo telescope mount, and they've gotta go change the film in the cameras, which you might think is an inconvenience, but it, is on every astronaut's account, the most fun they had on Skylab, nearly the most fun they had on Skylab, was going up there and 
really they had a little time to hang out and look at the earth while they were uh, while they're doing that and recognize the technology. For those of you who attended our uh, Gemini uh, talk, this is the hatch to a Gemini capsule. Now the reason they used it is because it was designed because that capsule allowed astronauts to get in and out because they did uh, spacewalks. The Apollo door is not designed for that. So they had to reach back into some, you know, ancient technology per se, uh, but it worked and it was fantastic. And they, they had an extra one lying around. Next are the solar arrays. These provided two thirds of the power to the station and they were folded at launch. These solar cells folded up this way. If you can see, they kind of look accordion-like down here. So these would fold up and then there would just be this white metal bar here, which is the same bar here, and then they folded down. So they were just like wings of a bird and these were called solar wings. And they, just as if a, a bird shut its wings and put it down on its side, that's how uh, it was going to be launched or, or that's, you know, so, so they hoped. Then this part's the orbital workshop. We're going to talk a lot about that. We're going to go and, uh, and look at each, each component and see uh, how the astronauts lived. Ultimately, it was all tucked up into this configuration. The Apollo telescope mount that would have been here folded up, the windmill of the solar panels all folded up, and crossed here was a micrometeorite shield. And we'll talk about that later because that caused an issue. And then they tucked it all inside the Saturn V. It was all pretty elegant when all was said and done. And uh, again, they, they hoped that that was going to solve a lot of uh, technical solutions to get Skylab up. So inside Skylab, the orbital workshop part where the, where the, where the astronauts lived. Um, it had two floors to it. They called them decks because the first crew up was a Navy crew and they got to name everything. So they called them decks. So that's the top deck and the bottom deck. Other crews called them all other types of things, first floor, second floor. But anyway, there were two decks. And it was made out of a mesh that allowed them to wear boots that had triangles on it and they could click in. So they had different tasks to do and, and floating around in zero G would have been great, but they got to stop and do things. And this was a way of getting them to be secure on the floor. And um, it, it worked quite well for them. This is the top of the workshop. Through this opening here is where you go through to the uh, Apollo telescope mount. Look how huge that is. It's circled with storage lockers. And again, this is the ceiling. It's almost like a, a pill capsule. It's, it's, that's the very top. There's handrails for the astronauts to get around. And right here in the, in the red circle is the, uh, it's the lost and found. Now, why is it called the lost and found? Because that's the air vent that uh, sucked the air in from the top. You can see kind of the octopus arms come out and that shot the air back down. So when you lost something, uh, you could generally find it there. And that was a big deal because losing things in Skylab was incredibly easy. When you think about it, if you lose something down, you don't say, where did I lose? Where did I set that down? Or if you drop something, you know it's on the floor. Well, in Skylab, if you set something down, it didn't stay there. It moved. It went around. It got under things, over things. It floated around. They were losing their pencils. They were One astronaut lost his glasses for two days. Uh, he was more than annoyed. They eventually found him. Uh, but ultimately, everything got sucked up to that. And they actually would, would check that almost daily to see if something showed up there. I, so, Phil, I believe they actually used that same technique on the International Space Station. Oh, do they? Yeah, <laughs> that uh, they're looking for things, and then they they go to the <laughs> the, the air intake, and um, often often they find it there. 
Because <laughs> I got to tell you, I don't need any difficulty in losing things. I do it just fine in gravity. You too. Me too. Thanks. So this is from the top of the dome looking down. This is the top deck. Those astronauts in the middle are actually on the bottom deck. And on this deck are spacesuits, it's experiments, it's kind of bric-a-brac. -bric. They tried to keep the bottom deck kind of like the living space where the astronauts was kind of their own. And the rest of this is, is, is workspace. There's a little video of a fly-through, and I do mean fly, through Skylab. This is the docking adapter. Now they're in the airlock, and now they're coming out the top of the dome. Dr. Joe Kerwin actually giving a little somersault as it ends. So as you see, Skylab is, Skylab's big. So here's the bottom deck. We're going to talk about a few things uh, in each room. And uh, then we'll, we'll go into depth a little bit more about, about some of them. Uh, you already have seen this. This is the ward room. It's a fantastic room for them. They spent a lot of time there and, and ate all their meals. This was a, uh, a bicycle that they had. Uh, because the big thing uh, in zero G is to uh, do a lot of exercise. And this is where they slept. They had little, uh, little bunks, little, little sleeping bags. And down here, this draconian looking experiment is a pressure tube that they slid into and it made negative pressure around their legs suck the blood out from their lower or from their upper body and head and made it appear that they were back on earth. So they would take readings and then they would let the pressure go and then see the difference when they were on zero G. Because one of the things that is extremely clear from what the astronauts did and experienced is they were experiments right along with the experiments. There's absolutely no doubt about that, that, that that's what they were that they were there for. They weren't so much doing the experiments, they, uh, they were the experiment. Additionally, and we'll talk a lot more about this, this is uh, how the astronauts go to the bathroom in space, one of their, one of their favorite uh, topics when they, do, when they do lectures. And this is a spinning chair that they have called the vestibular chair. And it swings them around to make them space sick uh, to see what it takes to make them space sick, uh, which in the case of more than half the astronauts, they didn't need to get spun around. They, uh, they got it before. And this is, in the bottom, this is where the garbage went. Um, Skylab, unlike our current space station, did not have the ability to recycle water. So everything is thrown away through that hatch in the bottom, which goes to an unused fuel tank that is a vacuum underneath there. So when they put it in and close the lid and push a button, it is gone. And they had these white bags that they get it all in. And it did jam occasionally, which is very frustrating for them, but they, uh, they worked through it. So Skylab got there uh, from the launch of what I call the last Colossus, the, uh, the Saturn V, the absolute last one, but, but wait, wait the flag. It, this I find is, is a funny story. Two days before launch in Huntsville, Alabama, the center there, they, they asked, we, uh, we don't think we have a flag on Skyland. And everyone says, I can't believe it. You, you've got to be kidding. Now this, this has happened before in the space program. These folks are incredibly patriotic, but they just somehow leave out the flag. Apollo 11 was the same. Uh, 
days before the launch, someone said, where's the flag? And they didn't have it. So, you know, there's a lot of myth around it, whether they went to a Sears store, whether their company in Michigan that lays claim to it. They put it on the outside of the, of the lunar module in a square metal tube that they strapped onto the ladder at the last minute. And if you look at Aldrin going down uh, onto the moon, you'll see that there. So anyway, they want a flag on Skylab because they've left that out. So they suggest that they want to get a, they want to get nylon and they want to cut nylon and paint a flag on it from paint from the hard store, the hardware store. I know this is high tech, isn't it? And they want to Velcro it to Skylab. They're going to Velcro in a part that is protected during, during launch, but not protected by much. So they do some research and find out that the nylon isn't going to make it because the sun will make it fade. They even get some paint that a guy who owns a boat in town has, and, and that doesn't work. So they decide to get a piece of sheet metal. They paint a flag, and they Velcro it to, uh, to Skylab, and it did make it. And I don't have any here, but if you do look at some pictures of docking, you'll see a little uh, one foot by one foot American flag. And it, it looks like it was painted by hand. But anyway, uh, just a, what I thought was a fun story about the American flag. So the last Colossus, the Saturn V, this is, this is 12 being rolled out to the pad. And this is Skylab on the pad. What you'll notice are the tops are different. Uh, on the left, they've got the command module and the lunar module, and on the right, they've got Skylab all tucked in there. But this was the last time that we launched a Saturn V, and you know, when when you look at the power of the rockets that they have on the drawing board, and even though NASA says that the space launch system will be the most powerful rocket uh, ever made, when you when you add up some of the numbers and see how much weight the Saturn V could put up in space, the Saturn V will remain king for quite a while, and that's including SpaceX. So here's the last launch of Saturn V. T minus 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. We have ignition sequence has started. 6, 5, 4, 3. Zero. And we have a liftoff. The Skylab lifting off the pad now, moving up. Skylab has cleared the tower. Mark 18 seconds, pitch and roll program started Saturn now, maneuvering to the proper flight path attitude. Picture perfect launch. The astronauts uh, who are not on board because they're going up in another rocket, they all start to leave. Everybody starts to leave. And then this video is going to pick up uh, where uh, the last video, approximately where the last video ended. Program started. Saturn now maneuvering to its proper flight path attitude. Mark 25 seconds.
10 minutes into flight, as planned. The second stage of the Saturn separated, firing its retro rockets to withdraw from the payload. And the plumes of those retro rockets quickly impinged on the number one array, breaking its hinge and totally shearing it off. Telemetry from this point showed a sudden loss of temperature readings and inexplicable voltage dropouts, which the board took as indicators that the array had physically separated from the workshop. The effect of the retro rocket plume impingement was observed almost immediately on the number two array temperature and on vehicle body rates. Under normal circumstances, the two arrays would have been freed from their attachments by a small explosive charge and spring-loaded hinges would have automatically unfurled them. Unfortunately, the number one array was gone and its companion was so clogged with debris as to be effectively pinned to the side of the workshop and could only partially open. Still, the station was placed in a 434 by 441 kilometer orbit, inclined at 50 degrees relative to the equator. So the picture perfect launch, without a doubt, had some problems. And the reason that it fell off is because in the first place, it didn't fit correctly. It was only 90% in contact with Skylab. So there was 10% gap in between the micrometeor shield and the uh, space station. They had to get a special sign off to fly it because they, they strapped it extra special and said that uh, that would work. But what they didn't know is that there were some small access tubes above the shield that weren't capped off. And what that allowed was this huge stream of air to be coming down this, the right next to the um, the shield, and just like a tarp, where you go down the road and you see someone who hasn't tied their tarp down real good on the top of their car, that's the same effect that happened with the shield and just just ripped it off. And that was that that was a big deal because not only was it, it, it a uh, keep them safe from micrometeorites because there's not a lot of satellites up there at this point. They're not to worry about space junk uh, that comes later. Um, it also kept, as we'll find out, the station, uh, the station cool. The crew now have to come up, but it's going to take them a while. They're going to have to figure out how to fix this station, and NASA goes into Apollo 13 mode. They, they uh, have learned lessons from that event, and they immediately get all the contractors, everybody together. It's a full court press. This is a bit of a photoshopped picture. This is Skylab on the right, and this is the Saturn 1B getting ready to launch uh, later to take the crew up. You can get them in the same photograph. The launch pads are that close, but this was done so you can see uh, the size difference. And also, it is kind of funny, it's sitting on a milk stool, they call it. Uh, and that's because the access points to the rocket are the same as this rocket. So rather than cut all this down, they brought up the Saturn 1B on the milk stool. So we'll be looking for liftoff right at the T0 mark. We passed the 15 second mark in the count. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, we have ignition sequence start. All ignition, all ignitions are running. All engines running. We have a liftoff. And the second band crew has cleared the tower. Roger, rolling pitch, Skylab, and uh, thrust looks good on all engines. Albion reports. Albion reports the automatic maneuver that puts Skylab on the proper course. So this is the crew launch. This is actually the second crew to go up, but it's the best video of it. And it took them 10 days uh, gap between Skylab going up and the first crew to go up because they had to figure out how to fix it. They came up with the idea of putting a parasol out the side of the window or out the side of a uh, 
uh, airlock that they had and using a shepherd's hook, which we'll talk about a little later. But they had it all on board, and this first crew, commanded by Pete Conrad, is going to try and do the repair. Love this comment. It said, we've been sitting there in Houston with a mock-up on the table playing around with toothpicks and string. And that's about the way it sounded. Uh, but it actually uh, did work. So uh, here's a, sh a video on how they repair. Well, the video in a second. This is a picture of the damage. This is the uh, wing that didn't fold or didn't unfold. And there's the solar panels ready to go. This is where the meteorite shield would have been. This, as luck would have it, is an airlock to the outside where they would have put items that they wanted to get exposed to the sun to see how they degraded. This is where they can come out and put this solar uh, parasol, which looks just about like, uh, you know, with a little umbrellas uh, for a nice tropical drink. Rendezvous the command service module in Skylab was accomplished in the fifth orbit. On reaching the station, Conrad flew their Apollo command service module around to inspect the damage and provided visual confirmation that one of its two solar array wings was missing and the second one was only partially deployed. With the temperature inside Skylab approaching 125 degrees Fahrenheit and no guarantee of clean, breathable air on board, the whole manned Skylab program was in jeopardy. However, Skylab 2 crew began what had never been attempted before, the on-orbit repair of a damaged, malfunctioning station. The crew soft docked to the station to avoid the necessity of station keeping. Then they undocked so that Conrad could position the Apollo to the JM solar panel. his body extending out of this command module hatch, and his legs grasped by astronaut Kerwin. Whites attempted to pry the surviving array free with a 15-foot pole, first with a shepherd's hook at the end, which was later replaced by a universal prying tool. However, attempts to free the solar array were unsuccessful. The crew then attempted to perform a hard dock to Skylab, but the capture latch failed to operate. So after eight attempts, they donned their pressure suits again and partially disassembled the command service module's docking probe. And the next attempt worked. On mission day two, after testing its atmospheric quality, the crew entered Skylab. The first thing they did was to deploy a parasol thermal shield through an airlock, and the temperature inside the Skylab dropped to comfortable levels. The crew still, however, had to adjust to a shortage of power. On mission day 14, June 7, 1973, astronauts Conrad and Kerwin opened the airlock module hatch and ventured outside the spacecraft. This time, the astronauts succeeded in removing the debris and fully extending the jammed main solar wing, restoring much of the electrical power to the station. During the CVA, the sudden deployment of the solar panel structure caused both the astronauts to be flung from the Skylab hull testing their nerves as well as the strength of their safety tethers. And after recovering their composure, both astronauts returned to their position on Skylab and completed the EVA. The spacewalk lasted three hours and 25 minutes. The way Pete Conrad described it, uh, to me, seemed just like a, a scene out of The Martian. They literally were thrown, and the only thing that brought them back, they were going head over heel, was they snapped at the end of their tether and started to come back to the space station. I can't see that being done, any of the things that they did to repair Skylab being done today. Um, everything seems to be too controlled and too precise. If it wasn't to save a life, I just can't see him doing it. And I wish there was a photograph of an astronaut being held by the foot outside their spacecraft with a 15-foot shepherd's hook trying to grab onto something. I don't think it will see that anytime 
soon. So, but they got it fixed, and that that was the what this first crew did that was fantastic. Um, the parasol uh, was made. Uh, the, there was some sewing room there at at Mission Control, uh, or in Houston rather, uh, and they got some people together and they just made it from scratch. Again, this is in ten days. Uh, and by the way, that's the same nylon they were going to use the flag out of. So they did make a second uh, uh, covering that would go over it that another crew would put up later because it would, wouldn't last. And here it is being uh, folded up. The reason I put that in is there was nobody at NASA that knew how to fold this up because it had to be uh, folded up much like a par uh, parachute was. So they brought in uh, Green Berets. And I'm not sure from this picture whether the Green Berets trained them and this is NASA engineers folding it up, or whether these are Green Berets, uh, they definitely would not have been wearing uniform uh, in NASA doing that. But anyway, that's how they got that folded up, and it, and it all worked in an amazing can-do NASA uh, effort. So life on board the ship, what's, what's life like on board? Well, the first crew had 130 degrees, and that didn't go down into the 80s and 90s for a week or so. So they only did a little bit and then went back to the command module. But other crews, pressure, the uh, temperature was just fine. The air pressure is at five pounds per square inch. The reason I bring that up is because, actually it's kind of cool, because on Earth it's 14. So what that meant was that they had to holler to each other if they were more than 10, 15 feet away because sound wouldn't travel. And they ended up losing their their voices in the beginning till they used the intercoms which they thought they weren't going to use um so just an interesting fact daily every day they exercise they have to draw their blood they have to centrifuge it and then all the separated plasma they have to freeze it because they're bringing every ounce of blood back they have to do all the planned experiments the apollo uh telescope they get three squares a day, three meals. They get to take care of their personal hygiene. There's the waste management. Again, they have to dehydrate that and vacuum seal it because they track what goes in and they track what goes out. They get a day off every seven to 10 days. They shower once a week. They change their underwear every two days and their outerwear changed weekly. So just a, a brief little snippet. I mean, they, they, they do a lot, and it takes a long time to do this. It takes an hour to go to the bathroom. It takes an hour to draw the blood times three people and, and do all the centrifuge. And doing things in space takes longer. Exercise. Here's a scene of astronaut uh, pool in movie 2001 Space Odyssey. And he has taken a bit of a jog around the outside of his spaceship. They were curious at NASA whether the astronauts would be able to do exact same, exactly the same thing. So let's see if they were. This is Pete Conrad, and he is able to do that exercise, running around that ring, and they did that often. Uh, this, I think, is the first uh, selfie stick uh, in space where he's making us space sick by, uh, by this particular view. And they did a lot of gymnastics. First time Pete did this, he dislocated his finger and had to have a, uh, a splint on it. Right now he's on something called the fire pole. That was put in there because they thought astronauts would get stuck in the middle. Uh, being weightless and not be able to uh, get around and they'd be able to grab that and see Pete's get here just fine. They also came up with other activities, uh, a ball. Um, they left it up there and crews found all kinds of different games to play and bounce. And, uh, it ended up being great fun and exercise and relieves the stress because their, their days were 12 to 14 hours. Um, and they're living in a, you know, a harsh environment right outside the, right outside the front door. This is the ergometer, uh, that they had, they had, they had to do this every day. Uh, it, 
uh, monitored their airflow, their heart rate. And what they found was, is this exercise uh, helped their cardiovascular system. It did nothing for their muscles. And they spent the first two weeks in pain because of the strapping that was on it. And they eventually just threw the strapping away, literally, and just went on it without it. They didn't need to be held down. The wardroom, at least for the first crew, the best room in Skylab. They ate every meal together. Uh, and the nice thing about it is right here is there's a large porthole. And in zero G, they were able to all look out together because they all put their noses on the glass on the edge and they could hang their legs out in different directions. So all three of them could watch at the same time and they had fantastic, uh, fantastic time doing that. These are the trays that you, you see in the wardroom. They, they were heated for some, refrigerated for other sections. They ate well on Skylab because the Saturn V was so powerful. They were able to bring their food up when it wasn't dehydrated. So even though a lot of stuff is creamed because they don't want crumbs in space, uh, they had you know, macaroni and cheese, they, they, they roast pork. I mean, it was amazing what they had. It also, water can be injected out of here. It's magnetic on the top. It holds their silverware. And then they had squeeze bottles of liquid because liquid can be, uh, be a challenge. And these are the food mostly came in tins like this. They had others that was uh, shrink wrapped. This is a biscuit and here's uh, chili with, with, with meat. And what do you do with the, the cans that you don't know what to do with? Well, you recycle them into a Christmas tree. Uh, the last crew of Skylab was there during Christmas, and they made a Christmas tree. And there's only been two American crews in space during Christmas, and the other one was Apollo 8. Okay, the waste management system. That is a toilet seat on the side of the wall. Absolutely. Uh, going, the astronauts will tell you going to, to the, going to the bathroom in space is not easy or pleasant. You know, for a lot of people, and most people, it's not easy or pleasant here on Earth. So the, there's a funnel with a hose for urine. And for fecal matter, they sit on that seat and put their legs in straps down here. And their fecal matter is collected in a plastic bag, which they then have to take and do a vacuum seal on it. whole process takes about an hour. And again, it... but but I have to qualify. This is so much better than in the Apollo program and in the other Gemini programs where I, I encourage you to read how they do it. We're not going to go into it here today because it's, it's challenging at, at best to review that. But they uh, you know, got mixed reviews, but that, is, that was an upgrade for the astronauts. They had a shower. Uh, a lot of pictures of Pete Conrad. I think he's the only astronaut of all of them, that was photogenic. He liked to have his picture taken. The shower was uh, an afterthought, and they, they never did it again. They didn't like it. It was too much water. It got all over the place. Uh, they used a washcloth and a little bit of soap. Uh, and what took an hour only takes 10 minutes. And that's currently how our space station uh, do the personal hygiene. Also have the flow runner of the, the flow bee. I don't know if anybody remembers that from back in the day. Uh, cut their hair with a vacuum cleaner. This looks like, as I recall, made a comeback during the pandemic. But So they cut their hair. They were all trained to be dentists. It was rudimentary dentistry, but they all did a uh, internship of, of a week in a dental shop. And they all themselves learned how to pull a tooth and pulled it themselves. They also had medical kits and they worked in ER rooms and learned how to suture, learned how to do medical things because there are no uh, there are no house calls at 270 200, 270 thousand feet above uh, 270 miles above the earth so they had to they didn't want to scrub a mission so they, they learned how to be doctors and dentists sleeping they strapped themselves in because they wanted to have the sense of gravity they felt that would help them sleep better astronauts found they really didn't need that but they didn't like floating around and ending up in a different part of the space station. So they strapped themselves in and they often found that if they just strapped themselves in upside down, they even enjoyed that uh, better because it seemed to be warmer, uh, that part of the space station. 
So now I just want to talk a little bit about the crews. We kind of talked generically about what they all did, but what was different about some of the different crews? Skylab 1, or, or is it really Skylab 2? Now I say it that way because NASA started calling Skylab 1 the launch of Skylab with the Saturn V. But the astronauts were told that they were going to be labeled Skylab 1, 2, and 3. So they went and designed their patches, 1, 2, and 3. Although NASA calls them Skylab 2. See how confusing it's getting. So the astronauts said, okay, we'll redo our patches. So they started to redo their patches. When NASA changed their mind, said, no, call yourselves 1, 2, and 3. So they said, fine. Then NASA changed their mind again. So what ended this uh, comical nightmare was the fact that all of these clothes and suits were already loaded on Skylab, and they all said Skylab 1, so nobody was changing anything. So the patches say 1, 2, and 3, but in NASA and the official records, they're 2, 3, and 4. So, you know, go figure. And their motto is, we fix anything. And that's what uh, Pete Conrad said a uh, few seconds after launch. That was his words. He said, we've launched and we're, we're going to fix anything. So they sent a moonwalker, which is Pete Conrad, a doctor, and a pilot. So Joe Curran was a doctor and Paul Weitz was the pilot. All Navy crew. They spent 28 days in space. And the Lonely Bull, that's a country song that they played for Pete Conrad the day before they left the space station. It's kind of a uh, going away present. He was so touched by that and impressed. He says, you know, you should have done that on the first day. So ever since that moment, on every American space flight, the astronauts are woken with music. That continued for shuttle, and it continues today for uh, the space station. They were on a real shakedown cruise. Uh, they didn't get everything done they were supposed to, but they, they fixed it so they, they could sit in the wardrobe and, and eat all they wanted. Uh, and they want, Pete's uh, motto for the crew and what he wanted was to walk on deck. They were told they were going to have to get in stretchers. And he had everybody exercise more because that was his, he just said, we're not going out on stretchers, even if we need to. And they didn't. They walked out. They proceeded to go behind closed doors in the medical room, and they all had to immediately lay down. Skylab 2. This is Al Bean, Jack Luzma, and Owen Garrett. They had a little interesting launch. Uh, after they got in orbit, uh, there goes one of our, fluster, our thrusters floating by the window. You don't hear that often in space capsule. We'll talk about that in a minute. This, again, was another moonwalker, two rookies. So you see the pattern here. We got moonwalker on one, moonwalker on another. And these two moonwalkers actually walked on the moon together on Apollo 12. And this wasn't an all-Navy crew, but there still was two, two Navy on this and, and one, uh, one Air Force. They spent 60 days in space, and Al Bean, rather than uh, his thing, rather than walking on the deck, his, he wanted to blow away their objectives, and he ended up being 150% off objectives, which means getting all the uh, experiments done and everything that NASA asked him. And I included this because this was a really poignant comment from his journal. He, he, he said, in Apollo, you go just for a visit or a trip in zero G, in Skylab, you live it. And he considered Skylab his greatest achievement. He figured, he figured that he had done more for uh, space travel than actually landing on the, on the moon, which, which I thought was pretty amazing. This is an old scientific calculator by HP. Some of you might be old enough to remember. I know I am. I had one in, in, in high school and college. I love that calculator. It was, it was great. <laughs> reverse, yeah. reverse Polish. I, you know, I, I really <laughs> wish I could... Uh, have a calculator to do that again. I, uh, they, they were, you couldn't break them either. So because the thruster had fallen off the command module, uh, they only had three of them. So it was going to be difficult to meet up with Skylab. So they're racing toward it. Al Bean's in charge of, uh, of trying to wrestle it toward Skylab. And on board, they don't have any computer that can give them the range distance. So they don't know how fast they're closing. They can only go by sight. And in space, you have no point of reference. So he doesn't know how fast he's going. So 
Jack Luzma, who's in the uh, center of this picture, he's feverishly figuring out the range on this calculator. And he said, you got to slow down now. you got to slow down now. And I'll say, no, I don't. No, I don't. i got to keep going. It got to a point where Owen Garrett unstrapped, climbed out of his seat, and went behind the seats where there's a little little bay that you could go. Unprecedented, really, in, in, in space flight. And that got Al's attention. And then Al, who was a good commander, he, he then listened to his people and said, wow, you know, he said, Jack's, Jack's a lot smarter than I am. And, and Owen, that was a big thing to do. So he slowed down and they made it and they docked correctly. But that, that calculator, sadly, Jack Lozano wanted to, to buy it, uh, to keep it as memento. They wouldn't let him. They put it in storage and then it was thrown away. It was a nice piece of history, but you know the government. Because the thrust, thruster fell off, they thought they might have to rescue the crew. So they were jerry-rigging a command module to be able to fit five people when they did simulations and found out that they were going to be fine with the thrusters the way they were. And then they put on the actual sun shield that made it much cooler down into the 70s at times and 60s in Skylab. And they did that before they left. So again, this all is a team effort. In Skylab 3, it was Jerry Carr, Ed Gibson, and Bill Pogue, all rookie crew. They spent the longest in space, 84 days. They are originally scheduled for 56 or 54 days, 56 days. They got bumped to 84. They got to see Comet Kohotek. They were one of the few people who did. That was the first, in my memory, comment that the media got behind was going to be the comment of the century. And... Uh, you couldn't see it with the biggest of telescopes. And they had the worst case of space sickness. Uh, Ed Gibson was a scientist and not a pilot and astronaut, and he ended, up getting, he ended up getting the sickest that any of the astronauts had gotten. And that put him way behind. They got to test out something called the MMU, uh, which was later used in the space shuttle for uh, skimming around space and to do repair work. They got to play around like the other crews, and there was, without a doubt, they had the crew with the most facial hair and hair. They did not do anything with their beards or their hair, and without a doubt, here's a nice picture of them here. They were the scruffiest-looking crew. And that's a, they let things slide because they, they had a bit of a dress code. But again, at 274 miles up, you're not going to get an inspection. So their model, like the others, was sprinting a marathon and that's going to play into the idea that there was a mutiny or a strike on the third mission of, of, of Skylab. And it's an urban legend going around that there was an argument with Houston. The crew shut off radios and took the day off. They refused to do the planned work. And the crew never flew in space again. And if you Google mutiny or, or strike in space, I'm because the internet wouldn't lie, you will see site after site regaling how the astronauts did all this and eventually turned on their radios and went back to work. Well, the truth is, it's an urban legend, but it was started by two incredibly respectable people. A journalist for the New Yorker called Cooper, F.S. Cooper, I think, and I've read some of his books on the space program. He talks about the mutiny two years after the last Skylab flight, and Harvard School of Business does a case study on how problems can happen in space for their business classes using what's in his book. And it is all completely false. Uh, what happened was, is mission control scheduled too much work. And the astronauts were afraid to say so. And they got backed up and they got frustrated and they kept asking for less work. And this is in part because one of them was very sick and they also never gave them a breaking in period. They expected them to be at full steam the minute they got there. So they had, they changed the work schedule uh, and they went off to be a very successful crew. There were no radio shut off. There's no evidence of that in the transcripts. They did their work as planned. And as far as the crew never flying again goes, uh, they all retired from NASA 
each like two, three years afterward, there was nothing between Skylab and the space shuttle. So there was nowhere to fly. And they all got nice jobs with contractors working on the space station, International Space Station. So a big, big myth that, that isn't true, they were a fine crew. The rescue. One of the things that Skylab was able to achieve was great solar observing. And that's because the sun was at like a 20 year maximum. And the problem is all that ejecta from the sun hitting our atmosphere slowed Skylab down. So its orbit began to get lower and lower. Space, which was an effort between NASA and the Air Force was really going crazy on changing expectations and the space shuttle, because the space shuttle to Skylab. So, I'm sorry, I'm pausing. I just got a note saying my internet connection is unstable. Well, I, God, I hope not. Uh, you, okay. Yeah, we, your, your audio dropped out briefly, but you appear to be back, so... Okay, good. Press on. Absolutely. So they made something called a teleoperator retrieval system. It was remote controlled. They were going to uh, take it up in the shuttle, which they weren't going to do because it didn't, uh, because it got delayed. But they could send it up with other rocket boosters. And this is with the, uh, with the space shuttle. And I was surprised. At the time, I was extremely bitter about this, that they allowed Skylab to uh, deorbit. And, and I found that in putting this together for tonight, I haven't lost any of that at anger that they did that. Um, they, they just dropped the ball because they're just so myoptic on this space shuttle that they just, I uh, just really said they could have saved it. And, and they did not. So on July 11th, 1979, Here's a picture of, uh, of Skylab coming and, and deorbiting. Landed in Western Australia. Here's a comic at the time. They did send a bill for littering, of which NASA did not pay. And I, I think it's some rumor a radio station paid it just like five years ago or something. But it was, it was, it was a simple ticket. But NASA wasn't going to do it. Uh, here's a pretty good sized piece came down. I mean, if that uh, if that individual was underneath that, that would have uh, that would have been a bad day. Um, but that is the biggest piece that landed, and all of it is still in Australia. They weren't giving any back, I think, because we never paid the littering fee. So what did we accomplish? The life sciences. We learned that 50% of astronauts get sick. We renamed it space adaptation sickness because it's really an adaptation to there being no up, down, left, or right, rather than motion sickness. So all space travelers need to get acclimated to it. You can't go out on a spacewalk day one. They slept well, they ate well, they felt well. They were all in good spirits. So you can live and work in space. And spacewalks were meaningful. The ones we did earlier in Gemini and Apollo were kind of primitive and they didn't always have good results, but I mean, hey, a guy hung out with his leg in a pole and he's grabbing stuff. I mean, they, they did, they did good work. You lose blood volume loss. There's loss of strength in legs and arms. Bone strength is reduced. They lost a couple inches in height. Most reported losing their sense of thirst. They dehydrated because they weren't thirsty. The theory is that your fluids are in your body evenly because you're in zero G. So your thirst trigger doesn't work, but there's no, no definitive proof on that yet. They lost an average of 10 pounds. The good news here is all of these things are reversible. They can be treated in orbit. Rather than lose strength because they're doing cardio, our space station now, they do, do strength. So we learned an incredible amount from that. From the solar astronomy and Earth, they learned a great deal. But they did say that there was no clear advantage over Earth-based satellites. Next is the material science and the student research. All the material science experiments went good, the welding, the, the crystal growth. Now there's one student research where the spider became an international uh, sensation. Let me introduce you to Arabella. Arabella first left her nest and made a horrible uh, spider web, which I didn't realize. Apparently spiders eat their web and then make another one. So the second attempt, was perfect, looked like she would in the, in the natural world. And that's important because it shows that not only can humans be adaptable, 
but uh, other creatures can as well. And they were so popular that the astronauts asked Houston to stop stressing and making the, their TV broadcasts what the spiders were doing because they said they weren't getting enough, enough TV time. So recommendations for the future. No chairs. <laughs> I laugh at that one. It's, it's cute. It's only in there for tongue in cheek, but there were chairs in Skylab because people who are doing the designing didn't quite realize what zero G was doing. And they, they unbolted all those and stowed them somewhere and design more for zero G. They deliberately made the floors and the cabins and the sleep areas because they didn't want astronauts to get disoriented. And they were like, we're fine. After three, four days, we're fine. You know, design for zero G. High volume of space to live in is the way to go. And the stations can be a viable resource for science. And the computer system of Skylab was made in Oigo, New York. And it was the first that was in tandem. There were two. There was one and a backup. They had never done that before. It was a, uh, a four PI. I don't know if there's any computer geeks out there to know what that is. It was 16 bit and had 2000 whole lines of code. Uh, but I can guarantee you that it was not as powerful as any of the cell phones anybody has here today listening to it. The computers were such a success and so, so well done. They were used on the space shuttle. They weighed 100 pounds which for its day was a light computer. This they felt, those who did Skylab, was the biggest takeaway that was not done in the, in the International Space Station. On the left is the International Space Station, all 15 feet, 16 feet width of it. And on the right is Skylab. The difference in the volume is just phenomenal. Now granted, they lost the Saturn V, but they felt that that was the biggest takeaway was the space for people to be able to exercise and move. And as you can tell, that is the last crew of Skylab because lots of facial hair and they actually wore their clothes and weren't in shorts a lot because it was much colder with the, uh, colder with the sun shades. So the rhyme of the ancient mariner, I wanted to add, end with this poem. Uh, it's a, it's a famous poem about the sea. You probably know one line from, you might know the whole poem or, its most famous line is water, water, everywhere, not a drop to drink. So the fair breeze blew, the white foam flew, the furrow followed free. We were the first that ever burst unto that silent sea. So Skylab really was the pioneer of living in space for all that will follow and should be remembered more than when something from space is going to crash onto Earth. Some resources that were used for this, uh, some great books, the one on the, all the way to the left, if you want the schematics of all the equipment on Skylab, that is for you. And the others are, are also really good reads, uh, film credits, and, and some of these are personal recollections I had. I was lucky enough to uh, meet with Dr. Werner Von Braun, and he discussed the space station and his, his displeasure with how small it was, Al Bean, Bob Crippen, and Jack Lausbaum. So some of the tidbits I gave you were from uh, discussions I had with those. So thank you very much. Sorry we went a little long. Uh, absolutely, an apology will not be uh, <laughs> accepted. Uh, it just you know you can keep, you can keep going. It was uh, this was great. Uh, so again, for those of you that are watching on the live stream, if you uh, have any questions, go ahead and uh, put them in uh, in the uh, in the chat. Um, as it occurred to me because yeah, I know, like with the with the space station, they have to every six to eight weeks or whatever uh, reboost to uh, so that it doesn't fall into into the uh, into Earth. And um, do you recall uh, what the, uh, what Skylab had as far as being able to uh, uh, you know, to keep to keep their uh, their their altitude up? Yes, they had. They had rocket jets, thrusters, that would little nudges at a time keep them going. But each of the command modules before they left sped up Skylab. They did a rocket burn and brought it up back up uh -huh. however much it had dropped. All right. Well, that, that, that would certainly make sense. And uh, uh, yeah, that what we're seeing right now, you can see a great uh, – 
uh, great shot of that uh, of the paracel and um, uh, that you know that ultimately cooled it down. And uh, I was doing a little bit of reading on that, and and the uh, uh, the guy that designed it was actually uh, uh, he actually never went to college, but they called him Mr. Fix It. Uh, <laughs> I think his name is like Jack Kritzker or something like that, and um, uh, received really high accommodations from uh, uh, accommodation from from NASA for uh, for the for this uh, uh, for this fix. Yeah. So I know um, they were pumped for fixing it. They were kind of like yeah. you know Apollo 13, take that. We got Skylab fixed. Yeah, so. yeah. So uh, let's see here. We do have a, a couple of questions and uh, uh, and comments here. Uh, so David asks, uh, did uh, did you mention what what was the potential longevity of Skylab? What could it could, could had have been? What could have been? There was a plan for the first shuttle flight to visit it and put on that unit that I had showed the teleoperator mm. and stabilize it. They were then going to uh, dock with it, bring a, bring a new docking unit to it. That was one shuttle flight. It was a total of five shuttle flights. The second flight was going to dock with it and redo some of the atmospherics. There was this whole kind of like refurbishment thing. Each shuttle that was going to come up uh, did more and more, uh, replace solar cells, uh, replenish the fuel. And then by the fifth one, it was habitable. And they were also hoping that by the fifth one, they were even thinking about bringing up the exterior fuel tank from a shuttle launch and then they would eventually mate that to Skylab and that big volume would be turned into a uh, part of the space station. Interesting. All right. They had plans. They mm. had no money and no space shuttle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Dale asks, this is, uh, is I've got the Lego model of the Saturn V for the moon missions. I wonder, has anyone ever made a, a, a you know, a variation for, for Skylab or do you know of any, any, uh, model, a company out there that has done a Skylab model. They have not, but I'm I'm pretty sure that if you search uh, Skylab Lego, I've seen people have, that have made them, and I think you can get their uh, plans or or diagrams of how they did it. But uh, Lego, to my knowledge, hasn't done that done that yet, or I haven't know anybody that does. Mm. For those of you who don't, who might be new to <laughs> new to Phil, if you will. Uh, Phil, actually, we met a few years ago, um, in, as we were anticipating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing, and Phil said, well, like, I'm a model builder, and I've got these models of the Saturn V, and command module, and, and lunar module, and, uh, would you be interested in having them displayed? And he just blew me away with the detail on this, and so, uh, um, again, I think, if uh, a Skylab, you know, a commercial Skylab model was out there, I'm sure Phil would have known about it. <laughs> you know, not, one never was, and, and actually the first model and replica that I built was of Skylab. I built a three-and-a-half-foot-tall version of it. Oh, wow. And sadly to the uh, ravages of time, those pictures are gone. But, yeah, that, that, that was my first. Because you didn't, you know, they did some models of, Apollo stuff around 69 when mm. uh, Armstrong was on. But then after that, it all dropped off the face of the earth. Um, one, of the, one of the astronauts I noticed, uh, Owen Garriott, uh, that was on Space Lab, um, I, I know him, uh, well, I know, you know of him, uh, primarily because uh, he was also a ham radio operator. And, oh, yeah? Yeah, and he was actually the first astronaut to uh, operate ham radio from space. It was actually... Uh, and a, uh, a little sort of a walkie-talkie kind of device and uh, an antenna that they actually uh, put into uh, one of the windows in the uh, space shuttle, in one of his uh, space shuttle uh, flights. And uh, W5LFL was his call sign. And uh, also interesting, uh, Richard Gar uh, Owen Garriott's son Richard was actually one of the space tourists that, that uh, launched and spent about two weeks on the International Space Station. He... He launched out of the um, out of out of Russia on a, on a Soyuz, and spent um, a couple weeks uh, on the space station. So there was sort of, I think, to my knowledge, the only father son <laughs> combination that have uh, that have been in space. And a very rich son. Yes, yeah, that was how he uh, <laughs> how he got here. I guess he was a 
uh, uh, computer programmer, and um, uh, so he was, you know, he used some of his um, uh, some of his investments to, uh, to to go and do that. In fact, actually, I was I was up here at Copernic when when Richard Garriott was on the space station, and um, uh, he sent down uh, some slow scan television uh, images, which we actually captured here up at Copernic. So, uh, uh, so David asks, uh, do you know of any models of the Mars rovers that are out? Oh, yeah. Yes, if you go on to uh, JPL uh, website, jetpropulsionlaboratory.gov, they have an entire 3D, um, 3D printer source of models, and that's the only one that I know of. Uh, you uh, you, you get build it your printed. Own. <laughs> for, it probably cost you about 100 bucks, but all the parts are 3D printed and a little crazy glue, and you've got a it's actually 14 inches long wow. and six, seven inches wide. It's it's a good size. Mm. It's a good size model. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I go through a lot of that filament. To make yeah, that and I, you know, I don't see that much model building anymore. See, I don't really. I do it as a hobby only of space mm -hmm. models. I don't do it as as a hobby just to build the models and and I see it as a hobby dying off. So with it come the space models. I see. All right. Um, let's see here. If there's any other uh, questions that, uh, that pop up here. And um, uh, another little uh, tidbit, probably more from uh, uh, the International Space Station, but you, you had commented how uh, that uh, on Space Lab, uh, Skylab, they um, didn't really you know, uh, have a way to they were all recycling their waters. You know, they had the, everything in the tin cans, and, and they were putting them in those, in those big bags. And then um, now would they just you know, shoot those bags out and they would deorbit, or would they come down with, with something? Do you know how that worked? And yes, the spare tank that was in the bottom of Skylab, which was actually a liquid oxygen tank from the original launching configuration, mm -hmm. that had the volume to – that they weren't going to run out of volume. So that you know, and they, and they brought all the other specimens home. They brought all the blood, the urine, mm -hmm. and that was the other. Not only did they not have the technology to recycle the urine, they wanted to bring it back to study it because mm -hmm. they really looked at, you know, all the food that they ate wasn't from like a grocery store. It was scientifically produced, and they knew all the vitamins and levels of everything in it, mm -hmm. and they compared that to how the physiology was was going. Uh, astronauts have never never ate better according to those who've been on the shuttle. Oh, I guess the space station eats pretty good. It wasn't Wolfgang Puck designed a menu for oh, one. Interesting, one interesting. Well, yeah, to that end, uh, maybe a bit of a scatological uh, 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 note here is that uh, one of the things that uh, again on the space station what they do is some of the um, uh, resupply missions that they bring up, they'll put their garbage in, in, in like those Soyuz capsules or whatever, and um, and they will be sort of ballistically reentered, you know, reentered re and, uh, and and burn up on on the way in. Yeah. So, uh, uh, very often now the fecal matter actually goes into those capsules. <laughs> Yeah, but the fecal matter of Skylab is valuable. They, oh no, they, no, no, no! I'm just saying, but but now right. with the, with the ISS, the right. one one of the astronauts was saying that um, so that sometimes that that shooting star that you're wishing on as it's coming yeah, in yeah. could could in fact be a, a capsule full of poop. Yes. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, um, I'll let you. I think you're. Uh, there is another question that uh, anyway. Uh, so we've. Um, had a great uh, a great talk. I really do appreciate your time, and um, uh, look forward to uh, having you come back down uh, and, and uh, present in person. Uh, right now, we are sort of going to go into a bit of a uh, not want to say hibernation period, but we've um, we're starting to prepare for our summer camps, and uh, so the next official uh, presentation, Friday night presentation that we've got will be um, actually on July tw uh, July 2nd, um, at least if, if for the moment. And uh, we got again a lot of things sort of going on right right now. But uh, 
if we manage to um, find a, an opportunity to uh, to bring a Friday night uh, program again, uh, we'll let you know. Um, again, for those that um, uh, didn't get a chance to check out the uh, uh, the live stream we did uh, yesterday that Jeremy Cardi did with uh, the uh, annular um, eclipse, uh, you can actually go to the YouTube channel that you're watching right now, go back and look at some of our videos. And uh, also, uh, uh, Jeremy actually put together a, uh, it's about a three minute uh, uh, high speed, you know, like a, t a 20x uh, speed up of the um, of the annular eclipse that he took. So you could sort of see how that progressed uh, uh, through that, you know, through that hour that uh, we, we had available to us. Phil, again, it's great, uh, great to see you. Thanks, uh, thanks again for uh, filling my my nerd bucket. <laughs> and uh, thank you very we'll, much. I appreciate being we'll, able uh, to. We'll digest some of that and uh, uh, look forward to seeing uh, people. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I look forward to seeing, especially some of those people that are watching on the uh, on the live stream, to actually get to to meet them when you come up here uh, come July. So, uh, with that. You all have a, a great uh, evening. Uh, stay safe. Uh, go outside, look up in the sky. There's a lot of good stuff up there. And uh, we'll um, look forward to having you up here at uh, Capernic soon. Take care.